Um, so, if you could please uh, mute your microphones, we'll, we would like to please ask you to mute your microphones. Um, but thank you for tuning in um, to our uh, virtual speaker series, uh, Zoominar um, of the ACMS. Uh, we're, uh, ACMS is a nonprofit educational organization that works to strengthen and deepen academic and cultural connections between the United States and Mongolia. Um, some of you may know our tradition of hosting speaker series physically uh, at the twice a month at the Nazik Deutsch Library, um, but you know due to the COVID uh, restrictions, uh, we've moved on to this uh, virtual platform. And I'm really pleased to invite you to welcome you to this uh, session on the field sciences in the coastal region. We have great speakers, and of course our um, moderator, Dr. Marissa Smith. So, um, if you'd like to be informed about our future sessions, uh, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel on which this uh, recording will be published. Uh, uh, so, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Marissa Smith. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, we're going to have a panel today with five different people, so I'm going to get right into it. I'll introduce each of them in turn. Um, they will each speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have some, some crosstalk between the panelists, and then we'll have a chance to go to the audience questions. Um, so looking forward to it. We're going to start out with, uh, with Dr. Um, Paula Dupriest who is the Deputy Director of the Smithsonian's Museum Conservation Institute. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for being here tonight to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the Darhat Valley. Uh, my talk is, I really work kind of like on really material culture. So I'm talking about the materials of memory and especially for these Mongolian Tuvans across this border. Now that's very hard, but used to be very, very uh, permeable. So I traveled to the, I'd been traveling to the Darhat Valley since 2002. Bill Fitzhugh went in 2001 and I went with his group the next year and went every year into the Darhat Valley until this year. It's really a very sad thing, so, but I'm happy to be talking about the Darhat Valley if I'm not able to go. So the Northern, I'm going to go back one. I don't know why it advanced there. So if this is Mongolia, you can see my pointer. This little thumb that sticks up is the area we're talking about in Havskal. And inside of Havskal, on this border between Tuva and Mongolia, is this depression called the Darhat uh, Valley. And I think all of the speakers are going to be talking about their experiences in this region doing very different kind of projects. For me, it's a very interesting region because it's a, an, a patchwork of different ethnic groups that probably come from the Manchurian period uh, that were solidified and brought into that area during the Manchurian period. And really, I've been in the Duha, the Darhat, Hatgoid, Halk, and Buryat, and Oranghai areas. And throughout those areas, there's so much that's the same and different, and it's a very fascinating place to work. I've also had the good fortune of traveling into Tuva once, and you can see here is that border, here's the Darhat Valley, and by helicopter we went all into areas that border on this, so that you could actually see the discontinuity as it separated after 1958 when the border was made permanent. In particular, I travel with and work with guides that are Duha or Satan, who are a reindeer-based culture. They're hunter-gatherers, they're reindeer herders, and they're shamanists. Um, the group itself has a number of different clan assemblages, and this may not be so easy to see, but some of them say that they're Uyghur from very uh, from 
separated for a very, very long time from the group in China. And there are a, a big clan group called Soyan and some uh, part, some smaller clans out of that. And also the Zut that come from this Tuvan area more in the south of Tuva. And then there's the Toj Tuvans that come from above uh, the Yenisei Shishkid Hahim River. And that's the Balish, several groups of Balish, Hular, and Urad, which is a group which is very interesting and not exactly a Satan, but married with them. And you see some of their remnants in this area. So those groups arrived in Mongolia all at different times, all in different ways and all for different reasons. So there's no one story of how they came or when they came. Uh, so my guide, my guide that I worked with for so many years, Sanjinwa, uh, came first in 46. They were expelled and they finally got settled there in 1958 as part of that border agreement. I really do, and I'm going to be very brief, but if I had to categorize what I do most is look at outdoor worship structures. And my Mongolians would like for me to call those Ahilga, which is like the Buryat and Tuvan names. And the first ones that I saw and the ones that kind of set up my studies was this, which is uh, a group of three on Gurvan Sahan, which means the three beauties, which overlooks the Psalm of Saganor in the most northern area of the Darhat Valley. And on this narrow ridge line, not very big, not very impressive, is three different small peaks and each of them have a different worship structure. The one that's most to the east is this Duha Ongon and you see how very simple it is. A few sticks with white strips of cloth hanging off of them. The middle one which is the most prominent is a Darhat Buddhist Owo and you can see the use of the yellow color indicating Buddhism along with the blue sky color of Mongolia and another uh, group of the white uh, ties or strips. And this one has more silks and more of those Tibetan Buddhist prayer flags, more Buddhist uh, relics. And then the one that's the lowest one and the one that's furthest to the east is a uh, Darhat Shaman Ongon. And this is the ritual burial for a shaman here in this tree. And you can see the use of only two colors, blue and white. And that really set up what I was looking for as looking for outdoor worship structures and to see what was coded into them by the material culture that was left on them. Uh, I was very fortunate one time, uh, twice actually, to have gone to Selindava, which is the gateway to the hunting valley of the uh, Duha. And this is the hunting ovo that sits there. So when you go hunting there, you must leave something because it's an exchange culture. So this has about, at the time I saw it and documented it in 2007, it had about 95 different car uh, carvings or omelets, many of those the animals they wanted to hunt so you could do that exchange. You can see here the big horns on it and all kinds of things heaped up. Well, this kind of idea of making wooden carvings goes over to the smaller picture, which is Utrag um, Arshan, which is a sacred spring that's up near the Russian border to the north. And it has more than that plaques. You can see them tied up on the trees here and people are even displaying them. Because when you go, you stay for about seven days and you have time to make one of these honorific plaques. And people really like to do that. And they do it in a way that is uh, consistent with their cultural. I just showed this one because this is a very different thing. And for Mongolians, they will know it's a joke. So there's even humor at these kind of uh, sites. So these are, this is actually in Tatar's Sacred Spring Arshan, just on the other side of the Tuvan border. So this is Tuvan. And you can see all of these poles above the bathing huts where you go in to bathe in the mineral water in this hot, hot spring area. And they have these airplanes there. Why, of course, if you're Mongolian, you know that's because, if I've, as I've already said, these are ongons. When you pluralize ongon, you get ongot. And when you say airplane, you say ongots. 
So everywhere they're making this joke about their ongots flying over their spaces. And that's in Tuva, but here it is on a high ridge up on uh, uh, the Ulan Taiga area, very near uh, the West Thai camp. Uh, and it's called Airplane Dava or Ongots Dava, where they have to cross over to get from their summer camps the back way to get into their fall camps. So everything has this two or three different meanings. The real meaning has to do with these ongons, the ritual burial of the shamans. And this is one in the Bussingol Valley. I haven't been here. I've been into the Bussingol Valley, but they never took me to this one. But this is one of their most important shaman sites. And you can see this, the, there's, sorry, there's a ritual burial of the shaman in this tree and they're burning incense, arts, juniper here as they make worship. They need to do this about once a year and it should actually be done on Sagansar for the Mongolian New Year. But there's other auspicious days when they can go and do this work. And this one is actually uh, a different, that was, uh, that was a Soyan site. And this is a Balish site, which is actually closer in. Uh, and it's um, called Hushin, and it's on the north side of a sacred mountain. And you can see here all of the decorations, altars, and everything. And then these very particular decorations that I'll talk about a bit later, because they have a special meaning. This is the mountain that it's behind. So this is Agi, which is one of the sacred mountains. The uh, Shishing River is right out here. You can't see it here. This is one of the pastures that they use for reindeer because it's rather protected from wolves. And that uh, Balish worship site is on the back side of this mountain. I wanted then, as I come to a conclusion here, turn back to the first site I saw because I never understood for about 10 years what the first site was actually doing because it's quite a special site and it's not really an ongoing. I started seeing these things called Oglini Mod, offering trees. And in this area, people are decorating these pines for longevity with these white ties for purity and then putting them in the direction of the ongoing they can't visit but need to. And that's, this one is facing north toward Aggie, that site that I just showed you. And what this little Gurvan Sahan site actually is, sitting right here above Saganor, is it's actually, it represents that since 1986, when they were pushed out of Ulan Ul, the group that came here brought traditions from different ancestors in different worship. And they try to worship them all equally. The three sticks with the purity symbols on them are facing toward the three main ongon sites. Basingol, where I showed you the first one, Agi, where I showed you the Balash, and one up here on the Tingus River that we're still looking for to this day. Because people know it's there, but uh, not many people are worshiping it. So all of those things show us how that this, even if we kind of see it as a blank forested zone, is the place where history happened for the people that live in Darha. And they're actively communicating with these sites. Every morning when they sprinkle milk to the heavens, they're calling out the names of Bus, Agi, and Tingus, as well as other ancestral sites, even across the border in Tuva. So all of these things, when you see them, have a great meaning as part of the memory devices for these people. I just want to thank my guides that showed me all of these amazing things with hopes that they get to continue into the next generation in whatever way is important to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. That was very amazing. I, I learned a lot and those were amazing visuals you had. Um, next, we're gonna go to Dr. 
uh, William Fitzhugh, who is Curator of Arctic Archaeology and Director of the Arctic Studies Center at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. There we go. <clears throat> well, thank you, Paula. Um, that was a great, uh, your, your talks are always wonderful because they bring me back to the first uh, couple of trips that we made to Mongolia starting 2001 uh, with Adia and uh, some of your field team and botanists. And um, I went up into the country to meet the Satan and my interests are, I'm at, I'm at the Smithsonian, I'm an archeologist. I worked in circumpolar archeology span and one of the big issues for us has always been uh, the origins of the uh, Eskimo cultures and their art. And um, we know that these things happened uh, a lot in the Bering Strait region, but also <clears throat> starting about 2000 uh, years ago, there were a lot of influences from, uh, from Asia, particularly shamanistic uh, influences and and art. Um, and so I spent quite a few years uh, looking for the origins of Eskimo art and Eskimo culture. And uh, I always realized that one place I needed to get to, to really start getting into that uh, beyond the Bering Strait into Asia was to uh, go to Mongolia. And I had the chance to uh, go there with uh, Ed Neff, who was uh, running a language school at that time in, in uh, Ulaanbaatar. And uh, he was very interested in meeting the Tsatan, and uh, we, we took a team of people up there, <coughs> um, including Adia, the, the, the field guide that Paula was talking about. And uh, Ed purchased a bunch of horses, and uh, we all rode them up into the mountains, and it was one of my first experiences riding horses, certainly in the forest. And um, it was a revelation, because uh, it was wonderful meeting uh, all these Dukha people who still had tremendous amount of their material culture and their, their uh, spiritual culture, the Ongans and uh, beliefs. But uh, after a couple of visits up there, I realized after surveying that we weren't going to find any deer stones, which was the artifacts, the monuments that uh, had engraved art on them that looked very, um, very much, uh, some aspects very much like the art we saw in early Eskimo culture. So it stimulated my interest in exploring the, uh, the Deerstone culture and the monuments. Uh, and we really didn't know, <clears throat> we didn't know how old they were. We, uh, they were estimated to be about 2000 years old, which we put them in the early end of, early beginning of Eskimo uh, culture. But uh, there were no uh, good way to date them. They were dated stylistically by the uh, uh, images and the tools they found on them. So we started a project with the uh, Mongolian National Museum, and uh, we went on for uh, nearly 15 years uh, working on this. And I'm just sh showing you a picture of one of the earliest sites that we started working on uh, near La Lake Erkal, uh, between uh, uh, Muran and Hubskol. Uh, it's got one of the, the largest deer stones in Mongolia. So uh, we did a lot of uh, surveying and identifying these sites. And I'm just trying to see now if I can I'm not sure quite how to move my slide. Um, the space bar, oh, there we go. The space bar maybe works. <clears throat> anyway, here's, a, here's an image uh, of a few of these deer stones. So you, some of you are, probably a lot of you are familiar with this. It's become such an icon for Mongolia and, and uh, in its early cultures. And they have these wonderful uh, deer carved in uh, all around them, sometimes four-sided. They're always four-sided stones, they're not round. Um, and frequently they're struck by lightning, which is what you see in the one here, and they lose their top. But the deer itself is, um, it's got this uh, wonderful uh, body with a, a peak withers and, this, and scrolling antlers that you can see like waves just going down the back of these animals. And then they have this peculiar eye and a big long snout that sticks out here. Uh, it's an iconic form, and it just appears, you know, time and time again uh, on all of these uh, all of these stones, and sometimes on the rock art uh, in Mongolia as well. So this is kind of like a, a, you know, a spiritual image that's put on these stones, but otherwise they are um, anthropomorphic. And uh, you see a belt here, down here. You see some tools hanging on the belt. This would be a traditional man's uh, belt with weapons and and axes and uh, sharpening stones and other things hanging there. 
And then this is the body of the, uh, the torso of the stone. And then there's the head, which has been knocked off here. So here's another, <clears throat> another one. I guess maybe somebody's helping me with this. And you can see it more clearly in, in, uh, in this stone that has an oxidation surface that enabled them to carve through the oxidation surface. And you see this eye in the long bill. And, and uh, this struck me you know, very quickly that these uh, are not just simply deer pictures. These are pictures of transformed creatures, including uh, the great stag, the morale of Mongolia with the sweeping antlers seen here with uh, leaping uh, into, the, into the sky. Mostly they are shown po posed kind of going up. But then you have this very odd uh, combination. You have two antlers that come out the front, which the morale does not have. But these are very characteristic of reindeer antlers, the two brow tines that you get on the reindeer antlers. And then you have this round eye and this long snout, which is it, and, a, and a curved throat here, too. This is, the, this is the head of a bird, not the head of a deer. <clears throat> so these animals are really transformed creatures. They may be representing the great deer of the of the terrestrial world combined with the the uh, the head of a of a sea of a of an airbird that maybe will carry the spirit of this uh, deer stone person, you know, to the sky. And then, of course, you have down below you have all of this gear, which is the belt, and there's the shaman's uh, mirror and tools and so forth. And at the top, uh, you don't see on this one, but there is a, a necklace and. Uh, uh, sometimes a face, very rarely a face is, is shown. So these stones are anthropomorphic, and we think that they actually are uh, uh, personalized, that they really stand for a particular individual, not just like a standard deer stone. No two deer stones are, are identical. They always seem to be uh, created uh, for a particular person, showing the uh, individual tools that person has, and perhaps these uh, images of deer or deer birds are actually tattooed on the torso of the individual the stone is for. And you see that uh, even more when you, when you see the head. On the backside, you see a chevron. Uh, these are some kind of military insignia. We're not sure. They look like kind of sharp sergeant's stripes or something or other. But almost all of the deer stones have these things. And they're always in the same position. So the face of the deer stone faces east toward the rising sun. Uh, this chevron is always on the west side. And then you have the north, south, and south sides with uh, deer and other emblems on them. <coughs> uh, so here's a, here's a stylized picture that uh, Volkov wrote. Volkov was a Russian archaeologist who did a lot of work in uh, surveying these stones back in the 70s, uh, 60s, 70s, and uh, published a, a wonderful catalog of all the materials. And you see how the stones are set up. This is the faced area. It's always uh, shown in the east. And very often, there's uh, nothing on this face area, but sometimes two little slashes or three slashes. Uh, and in rare cases, uh, a face is carved in. So we know that this is actually an individual. Uh, we have an earring on the side. Over here, you can see an earring, and you see another on the on the north side, um, and on the west side, you see the chevron and so forth. So this is the structure of these stones, and we've uh, now pretty certainly uh, figured out that these are actually um, individuals. They're great leaders uh, of the territories they were living in. Sometimes there are many of them in large sites. Sometimes there are fewer. Uh, and uh, sometimes just individual, single individual stones. But many times in the larger sites, they'll be lined up in north-south rows, and you may have 10 to 15 or even 20 of these um, shown. Here's uh, one that we scanned with the Smithsonian uh, uh, modelers who came with us one summer. This is the famous deer stone uh, just west of, of Murun. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's the one that clinches the uh, argument where you actually see that these face areas are true faces and that they have uh, ear rings, these rings in an ear and so forth. Um, this is a particularly interesting stone because uh, this round mouth is uh, almost certainly the image of a shaman who's uh, chanting or uh, doing some sort of a ceremony uh, with a pursed mouth. And so uh, we see that there's a strong shamanic you know, connection uh, in these stones as well. 
So this is, uh, I think if we went back one, maybe, uh, let's see. I don't know if I can go back. Well, we're going maybe the wrong way here. Previous. Uh, so this is just to, just to show you how, how elegant these the carvings can be. They, this is the Bronze Age. This is not yet the Iron Age. This is, uh, now we've been able to date these by horse burials that are found with the stones around the stones as offerings and the horse teeth have given a date dates around 3000 years ago so this is uh, 500 years before the iron age and yet they are able to carve probably with bronze tools all this very intricate uh, material in the stones some of them are very large and uh, and spectacular so it was quite a this is a, a major feat these are the the um, stones that uh, are the first monuments in Mongolia, the first large scale monumental structures that we see in Mongolia. And here you see in this one, the, uh, the uh, Herixors, the burial mound sites that are often associated with the deer stones. Uh, and we have not been able to actually make a direct connection between a particular hub stall and a particular deer stone. Uh, they seem to separate the, the place where actual leaders are buried from the places where they are honored. Uh, and here you see the two different kinds of herixers, the, the herixer with a round uh, barrier or fence of stones. You can see that fence here uh, going around. And then there's a second type, which has got a rectangular or trapezoidal uh, form. Uh, and outside of these, to the east side, we see horse uh, sacrifice mounds and then around the many little hearths and so here you can see a lot of these horse sacrifice uh, stones here so large numbers of people came together at, at, at times of the death of some of these individuals and sacrificed their horses and there's a good debate going on now among the archaeologists about whether these things happened as single events or whether they were uh, recurrent annual festivals that honored the person in the dead uh, in the uh, in the herixor uh, and uh, it's kind of complicated to figure out, you know, which of these two ideas. Almost certainly, uh, they they uh, it was a major ceremony when they when they started, uh, and and they sacrificed the horses. They always put the horse head, uh, as you see here, uh, facing east, uh, and they put the hoofs uh, and the vertebra column, which you can just see in the in the, alongside the skull. So that's what they uh, put in uh, in these little crypts around the uh, uh, around the herixers and also around the deer stones. So it was uh, you know we pieced these things together slowly uh, piece by piece. Here's an excavation um, uh, north of or near Lake Hubskull, north of Murren, <clears throat> where you actually see a deer stone that has a um, uh, a little insignia you can't see here very easily, but it's a uh, a coiled feline carving. And here's the earring you see. So this is the south side of the stone that faces uh, east, uh, face, the base is, is facing east this way. And we excavated the whole area. And in addition to these big stones, we found lots of little baby deer stones here. You can see them standing up. And this is a real mystery. We haven't ever really been able to, uh, to date these individually, and there sometime they may be dating to the deer stone time. They may be dating to a few hundred years later, uh, around 2,400 years ago. And we found in the area here bronze slag and so forth. So these stones, are, you know, they start off as ceremonial stones, and then they get uh, to be reused later on, either by the same people or by others who come later who use the sites in different ways, and but still honor the. Uh, the spirit of the uh, ancestors you see in the stones here. And there are three types of these stones. There's a so-called Mongolian complex deer stone, a Cyan Altai stone that has more animals, uh, non-deer animals, in this case, moose, and then a third kind uh, called the Eurasian stone. Uh, and so there's some social significance and as well as some geographical uh, distribution differences between these stone types but the big the big ones are all of these in central mongolia these are often in northern mongolia and these are often in the western part and you see here in the slide below the one of these very big deer stone sites in the altai so these sites stretch uh, far west into western mongolia and even beyond and here you see the distribution of many of these sites in the greatest concentration in the center of mongolia a few scattered ones to the east 
Uh, and there's quite a lot that are not plotted here in, in Baikal and some of these areas, as well as in Xinjiang. And then they go west occasionally and uh, even occur uh, as far uh, west as the Black Sea and the Caspian and so forth. So this is one of the other big mysteries is how do these Deerstone ideas spread west and are they being spread by population movements as uh, you know, we know the uh, Turks expanded in this direction and also uh, Genghis Khan, the Mongolian Empire expanded in this direction too. So here we're talking about something that's happening around 3000 to 2500 years ago. Uh, and there's a big discussion now about whether, you know, uh, these currents were moving from, from the Mongolian heartland uh, to the West or whether there were some other things going on here, bringing European ideas, including uh, horse bridles and uh, chariots and other things, you know, east uh, eventually into China uh, below. So um, my final slide is just about a, a really intriguing deer stone that we found uh, south of Muran. And as you see, it's on the right here, you see all these different animals uh, that you don't see on the deer stone. You do see this, the iconic deer uh, in the middle uh, here, but you also see these wonderful pictures of tigers. Here's a frog on this side of the stone, and here's an ibis uh, on the other side of the stone, and here we have predators and, uh, you know, attacking uh, animals here, and here's we have uh, pigs and so forth. So but it has a lot of the characteristics of the deer stone. Uh, and uh, we think that this is the kind of stone that is, is uh, sort of uh, indicating the shift from the classic Mongolian deer stone period into the Scythian period, which is a, got a much more narrative style art. And here you can see a lot of the narrative features showing up in this art rather than the classic, you know, uh, on, the, on the left hand side of the slide, you see the classic deer stone. So we think that there's a, some, some culture contact and cultural evolution, you know, changes going on. And this is just about the time that we see the influences seeping into the North Pacific and ideas from, from these transformation animals and so forth uh, showing up in the Eskimo area too. It's not like there has to be a migration of Mongolians to the to Bering Strait, but uh, ideas may have been uh, passed from people to people, but there clearly is a lot of connection you know, in the north, across from Central Asia, across the, the Russian, uh, Siberian uh, tundra areas, uh, and into Alaska. So we really are looking at a, a wonderful uh, time period where the, the uh, Mongolian cultures were influencing people both to the east and west. And uh, we're, we're going to continue working on this, and it's been a lot of fun. And I really enjoy the uh, the efforts and work of my Mongolian colleagues at the National Museum and others who have made it possible, and many of the students who are now working in Mongolia started off working with us in these areas. So thank you, and I hope I didn't go too long. Thank you very much. Um, it was very, a very interesting talk, because uh, on the one hand, we are speaking a very small, small area of Mongolia, but you did a really excellent job of, of showing us how how broadly interconnected Mongolia is. Um, so Thank next you. we're going to be we're going to be hearing from Dr. Uh, Badam Garov uh, Dovchin, who is an interdisciplinary PhD candidate at the Land Resources and Environmental Science Department of Montana State University. Oh, and also I wanted to remind everyone, um, please go ahead and leave your questions for us in the chat. Um, and uh, we are collecting those, and we will be getting to those at, in, uh, at the end of our, of our presentations. <coughs> Over to you, Badma. Hey, thank you, Marissa. Um, thank you very much for the previous talkers, because, okay, let me, I'm trying to share my... Should we go to Rebecca and then maybe yeah, I think you, guys you can, can try and sort it out Rebecca and come back. Sorry, my uh, my mm -hmm. computer is not working with me. Okay, um, yeah, but I hope you get it sorted out. Um, I it, for me, uh, if you go to the top menu on the um, on the PowerPoint and do the drop down from view, it uh, that's where I was able to share my screen before. But I can I can go ahead while while you uh, yeah you can go ahead and then okay. I will fix this issue okay sorry um
So can everybody see that okay? Is my screen That's sharing? Good. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my work more from uh, kind of the, the perspective of building a program in Mongolia. Um, and I am always happy to talk at great length to anybody who wants information on the, the research itself and the, and the outcomes of the research. But I, I think I want to talk a little bit more about the relationship building and how I came to work in this part of the world, um, just to give some perspective on that. So. Uh, without further ado, um, I actually first came to Mongolia as a Peace Corps volunteer in 2000. I don't usually start presentations by sharing pictures of myself, but unfortunately this was in the era before um, we had digital cameras. So this is the only photograph that I actually have on hand in Montana from my Peace Corps days. So that's me in front of my gear with my dog, Georgia. And I first came up to the Darhad in 2001 as a volunteer on um, snow leopard surveys and uh, rode around in the Horridal Star, a strictly protected area, for about 14 days looking for snow leopards and really fell in love with the region. Um, however, my return to this part of, of northern Mongolia was mediated by this animal, which is not a snow leopard for any of those who are zoologically uh, challenged or inexperienced. This is a wolverine. And I was working on wolverine research in the United States, in the Western US, in the Rockies, um, which is sort of the southern uh, limit of the wolverine's distribution in the Western Hemisphere. And the wolverine research community in the United States was interested in learning more about wolverines in Mongolia, um, because that is the, the southern limit of their distribution in the Eastern Hemisphere. So. Um, when you look at a, a map of wolverine habitat in Mongolia, you see that the, uh, the largest chunk of modeled habitat is actually in the area around the Darhad Valley. This habitat model, by the way, is based on late spring snowpack. That's the yellow, so it's snow that's on the ground until mid-May and uh, cool summer temperatures. So that's the, the blue blue region. And I spent about five years from 2009 to 2014 in the summers um, fundraising small grants uh, coming over to Mongolia during the summers to um, primarily do interviews and talk to people about what they knew about wolverines um, and other wildlife because there's so much local knowledge and indigenous knowledge um, about wildlife in Mongolia that uh, you know, you don't have to have a GPS collar study and a bunch of really, you know, high-end scientific work to, to understand what's happening with wildlife in Mongolia. You just need to be able to speak Mongolian and talk to people as a, as a good starting point. So um, I should also mention that uh, my return to Mongolia in 2009, when I started this project, was really due to ACMS because my language skills had become a little bit rusty and they actually... Um, funded me with a fellowship to go back and, and improve my language skills. So they're a huge part of uh, getting me back into this work, which I deeply appreciate. If you zoom in on, or if you zoom in on that area of Mongolia, the Darhad Valley, you'll see that as Paula pointed out in her presentation, there's this, this big depression, a uh, big valley surrounded by mountains. Um, and this is the region where I was working. So the next step for wolverine research in this area was to get on the ground and look for some live wolverines. So after I had interviewed and talked to people and heard that there were all these wolverines up here, I kind of wanted to know um, what that meant in terms of if we were to set out and track wolverines, um, would we find tracks, would we find DNA? So in 2013, uh, along with four uh, colleagues, I got some funding from National Geographic and we skied 370 kilometers around half of the Darhad Valley. We wanted to, we wanted to do the whole thing, but um, we actually ran out of snow uh, over here. We didn't get into the Ulan Taiga region, but we did ski all the way from uh, Jigwig Pass around to the Hog River. And, uh, oh, I put this slide in all of these presentations because I was accused frequently of um, putting together this ski trip because I wanted to go and have a rad time skiing in Mongolia. So I just want to make it clear that there is no rad skiing uh, anywhere in the Darhad Valley. It was like this pretty much every day. It was brutal. We had 50 pound packs and we were uh, frequently, frequently in snow up to our waist plodding through. 
um, the snow is dry, it has no bottom, it never solidifies, you don't ever get a crust. So uh, yes, this was not about athletic prowess or having fun, it was about Wolverine research. It was, despite the kind of agonizing nature of a lot of the day-to-day -day conditions, it was actually a really successful expedition. Um, we were out for 23 days, we skied 370 kilometers, we found 28 sets of wolverine tracks, we pulled 38 DNA samples, um, and we found a lot of tracks of other species that are hard to detect during the summer, including snow leopard, um, right here on Otruk. So this is one of the sites that Paula actually featured in her presentation as well. This is Otrukindala. And we found snow leopard tracks right up on top of this pass. However, we did not get DNA, so by, it was not considered conclusive by the, by the international snow leopard research community, which was kind of disappointing. Set up cameras up there the next summer, didn't get any photos of snow leopards, also kind of disappointing. But meanwhile, um, so I was trying to figure out how to continue with this research. And um, at the same time that I was getting this Wolverine project going, the people in the Darhad Valley were um, banding together to fight against poaching and illegal mining that was happening in their valley and in the mountains around the valley. And in 2011, um, with 70% of the Darhad population signing on to a petition to parliament to form two new protected areas, uh, Ulan Tiger District and Gishid National Park were put under protection. And they were joined with this pre-existing Horridal Sardic strictly protected area, which had been under protection since 1997, into one administration. So all of these, uh, this huge area of pr protected land was put under the administration of an office in the Darhad Valley. And that gave me an institutional partner to work with, which really was kind of a game changer as I was thinking about how to carry forward with research. Um, the, Director of the park uh, is this man here, Tumersuk, and this is his wife, Nara. Both of them have been instrumental in um, working on conservation in northern Mongolia. Uh, I put this photo up of Tumersuk with wolverines in his lap because he can get away with doing something like this, but don't try this at home. If you encounter wolverine kits, please leave them alone. Do not pick them up and put them on your lap. Um, and then Nara is taking care of an orphaned elk calf. I suppose that's okay. Um, but yeah, the, both of them just care tremendously about wildlife, as you can see from these photos. And Tumersuk, as director of the Ulan Taiga Strictly Protected Areas Administration, um, assembled this incredible team of rangers and staff. And these folks became my partners in doing wildlife research in northern Mongolia. Now, my major interest is in climate sensitive wildlife and what we are going to do to protect climate sensitive biodiversity in the face of the enormous challenges that we, we are facing from climate change. Um, when I started talking to the parks, they were sort of like, you know, your wolverine obsession is cute and all, but um, we have a whole bunch of species in these parks that have never been studied scientifically and that we're really interested in working on. Can you? help us with that. And of course, I couldn't because I'm one person. <laughs> um, but I thought it might be constructive to bring in additional partners who could maybe provide a permanent funding source and also some additional, uh, I guess, bodies for doing the conservation. And we talked, I talked to Round River Conservation Studies, which is an organization that sends um, students to programs around the world. And we started a fully accredited uh, semester course in conservation biology. So it's four classes, um, American students, primarily a couple of Canadians who come over and they work for the parks for, for a semester doing the research agenda that the park sets out. And BADMA has been an essential part of, of building this program as well. So uh, without her, I, I don't think it would have happened or it would have happened, but it would not have been as successful as it has been. And so with the, with the help of Round River and um, the parks, working together collaboratively to, to build a research agenda, we've expanded our research to other cold climate uh, wildlife species, including pikas, birds, migratory birds, breeding birds, raptors. Um, this very weird and unique medicinal plant called von Simbru is very culturally important, and butterflies. Um, 
We also have a grid of 50 camera traps for wildlife that are out around the park. Um, and those are catching some amazing photos of mammals. We're gonna have a little bit more about that in a moment. The project, uh, of course, draws on the, the kind of expertise of technological approaches to science that Westerners bring. Um, so there's a lot of delegating to the students. Uh, they have to set up a program to instruct the rangers on how to use these new technologies that we are using in uh, conservation research, such as camera traps and GPS. But there's also, and e equally, if not more importantly to me, there is an exchange that goes in the other direction, which is about um, helping American conservationists understand that conservation did not begin with Aldo Leopold and John Muir, but that there are cultures around the world that have been doing this successfully for thousands of years before we in our Western colonial context in the US suddenly realized that you know, killing off all the native wildlife was probably not a great thing to do. And so bringing in um, you know, uh, understandings of cultural relationships to nature and letting the rangers uh, teach the students about that is, is a big part of this program as well. This is uh, Ranger Batakhtakh, who is, um, the students were here uh, learning about this uh, marmot colony that used to be here and it's now been occupied by pikas. You can see a little pika hay pile in there. Um, he's one of our, our great ranger instructors for the students. Um, they love hanging out with him, drawing. He's a great artist as well. Um, and so everybody likes to draw pictures with him and, and talk about uh, the kind of the ecological scenes that he's constructing in, in the, the images that he's drawing. Um, there's also a little bit of learning that happens about, um, you know, herding. So the student you see crouched down in the back next to the yak. I, some of you probably know what's going on here, but the student Alyssa had this preternatural ability to pick up Mongolian. She was a pre-vet student and somehow she figured out how to say, and I'm not sure how this happened, uh, she figured out how to say, I want to castrate a yak. And because the um, rangers were really entertained by her ability to say this, they, they decided that they were gonna make it happen for her. And this kid in the foreground here, his look of sort of skepticism uh, definitely mirrored exactly what I was thinking as this went forward. This is probably the most nervous I have, have ever been on a student activity that took place in Mongolia. I thought, wow, if she kills that yak, this project is over right here. But she successfully castrated two yaks, not one, but two. And then uh, we all went in and had some testicle soup. So, you know, it all turned out okay. But those are the kind of cultural experiences and exchanges that I think this, this program really excels at, at bringing in addition to the scientific research, which I'm also very excited about. Um, we also replicated our ski expedition last year. So we went back to see if the same wolverines were around because we were able in uh, 2013 to get DNA on um, six individual wolverines. We know who they are, we knew where they were. Um, unfortunately, the conditions were not as great and we were not, as able, we were not able to pull as many uh, DNA samples last year as we did in 2013. So I don't know whether we're going to find out whether those same wolverines are there or not. We're still waiting for the lab results. Um, but meanwhile, these are just a few fun pictures, again, of like the cultural exchange aspect with the students, which I, I, I really enjoy. This student went everywhere, his name was Cal, with a copy of the complete works of William Shakespeare. <laughs> um, he was just a, a really interesting kid. And then the, the, the last night at the, at the big dance party that the Rangers always have when the students leave, he uh, busted out some, some dance moves and taught both Tumorsuk and Lalgua, who are two of the higher ups in the park administration, how to do these, these dance moves. So. That was great. And then um, this is a student, Josie, who has returned to Mongolia after her initial semester to pursue additional work on Bonsen Brew. Um, she was really excited about the work that she was doing on that. And she's here uh, making a GIS map with two of the daughters of the, the park rangers and staff, Deggy and, um, and uh, Arvin. So these kinds of, kind of outcomes are the parts that even more than the publication of scientific results, I find to be really rewarding. And this, finally, our camera grid got a photo of a snow leopard um, in 2019. It was not a camera I set up, and I think that this is completely appropriate. Uh, it was actually a camera that Tumorsuk and the Rangers set up. And so they were the ones who were able to, to show conclusively, finally, that after 70 years of absence, um, there was a, a snow leopard back in the park. And it's a female snow leopard, so maybe there will be some more snow leopards. Finally, I just wanna share this because this is the, still the most important thing as far as I'm concerned. Oh, oh no. 
Why is this video not playing? Oh, there we go. Yeah. So that's a Mongolian Wolverine. So that's an overview and I look forward to any questions and um, thank you very much. Wow, wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm very, very glad that the Wolverine decided to let us see his image or her image. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're gracious like that, you know, sometimes they do <laughs> show themselves. Excellent. Um, so, um, Badwa, are, are you ready? Yeah, I finally figured it out. I had to get rid of another screen that I had. Well, um, now, can you see this now? Oh, I think we're still seeing Rebecca's screen here. Oh, okay, let me. Oh. Zoom in and share the screen. Yes. And that. Is it good now? Yep, we see you. Yep, looks great. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, what I do for my PhD. So a lot of what Rebecca talked about is also meshed with my work. So first, um, I've arrived in Dahut Valley 2001 as a tour guide, as a student of a foreign language education. That was the way that I would travel and also pay my tuition. So I ended up in Dahut Valley with a bunch of horse riders to see the reindeer herders. And I was the one who needed a translator at that point. And it's been about 20 years after that. So um, my work there is, um, I would like to go over this basic things, study area and stakeholders in environmental management in the Dark Valley and how I have used community-based participatory research method in Dark Valley to have the environmental management more inclusive and local value based way. So, um, Again, the location is the same. People went over it. So it's just the map that shows where we are. But the thing is, with all the culture, traditional ecological knowledge, the deer stone, all the centuries old knowledge of Mongolia started being, uh, you know, replaced by the Western science when uh, Western science came into Mongolia in the early 1900s. So when they come, they didn't just come, they started neglecting or like saying, okay, you know, heard this knowledge is good, but uh, we are going to use the Western knowledge now. We're going to be uh, measuring things scientifically. We're going to be managing things. And then after 70 years of, um, you know, working with Russians and Russia school educated people and NIGDEL, the uh, collectives in, trying to manage everything from centralized government, uh, Mongolia started having totally different ways of seeing the world and um, living their life. But yet again, in 1990s, the um, democratic revolution started. So um, it's just, you know, all of a sudden all the Russians left, all the structure, all the collectives and everything that was planned was gone. So for 10 years until early 2000s, Mongolia was under transition of environmental, ecological, social, all kinds of ways. So um, the end of it hit Darkhad Valley. You know, there were lots of things happened, but I just wanted to point out the gold rush that happened early 2009s till like the park formation, which is 2012. So when the gold rush happened, you know, basically 100 years later than the west coast of um, US, in Darhat Valley, there were 44 licenses. I mean, in Hovskol province, there were 44 licenses for mining is already allocated. And there were 7,000 ninja miners, which are the artisanal miners who just carry the bucket and pan it out. So literally the, um, headwaters off the dark valley if you go up and turn the rocks you could just collect the gold nuggets at that point so that you know attracted all the unemployed people from everywhere of the mongolia 
and that actually started all the social disorders and uh, criminals, you know, you know what, everything bad happens when all these people collected into lawless place. So that called Tumursuk, the head of the um, park, to come back and um, just, you know, help the locals because he's from uh, Darhat, he's from Molanol. And he was head of the uh, Hoof School National Park for over 10 years at that point. And he was called back home and he, as Rebecca mentioned, 75% of Darhats signed the petition and started having this big national park. Again, this park is uh, consists of three parks and it's, it's 1.6 million hectares. It's a pretty big um, park. And then, um, you know, Locals were happy because they didn't really have a safety, like they were worried about sending their kids to herd animals at that point. They were like, oh no, we can't send our kids out just without being um, worried because they're all those 8,000, 7,000 ninja miners, who knows where they're from and what they do. And then they, you know, they formed the park and they got rid of all the, um, bad miners, but, you know, things come with another price because when they have national park, they did not really realize there were lots of rules that they need to follow. And that includes the locals are also not allowed to mine and their hunting regulations, there are new regulations. And obviously at that point, they really need to have the law enforcement really hard on everyone because they needed to get rid of the disorders and everything. But now after six, seven years of law enforcement, they see the uh, protection is working, animal numbers are going up. As Rebecca showed, we have the evidences of all those um, animals increasing and uh, people are seeing, you know, the results of the park. But in 2015, when I started my PhD, I was like, I really need to know what these people are thinking about because I see that there's like camps of people or the groups of stakeholders who can't even talk to each other at that point. There was like, oh, we hate park. And some of them are like, we like it, but we would like to have exceptional rules for the local people. So I, this is the photo that <laughs> represents the herders researchers and policymakers were blindfolded like these eagles who are waiting for their turn in the hunting but they just they all want the same thing to manage the land really nicely together but they just cannot talk to each other because they only have their own little bubbles so my research is to help all of them come together and work together towards the same goal that they have so in order to do that, I had to use some kind of method. So in my previous work, I used to work for Bioregions International and we have used holistic management, which is the way to see things uh, in whole. So uh, the community-based participatory research method is another version of it. So it's more like the principle goes like the question of the research or anything that people are doing in the area has to come from the people, not the researcher. So I went out and did the whole valley survey and the survey actually ended up showing that we have three camps of uh, stakeholders, herders, local government, and the park. And they would like to manage the pasture, they would like to protect the animals, at the same time they need to leave together and also they need to be working together. So uh, when we reduced it down into, uh, you know, you guys have same goal, but we need to see the way to work with you guys. And then uh, this community-based participatory research is the way that um, facilitates the stakeholders to come into the same table. So we have organized the community meetings and then uh, formed two user groups, one in Bainzor, one in Rinchidong. So we started working on the traditional ecological knowledge and Western science knowledge, which we call the inclusive pasture evaluation system. 
So herders' problem is they would like to protect the pasture at the same time they would like to coexist with the park. So for the park, they would like to work with the herders, not you know, trying to work against them because for six years of law enforcement, they had to be working, you know, protecting everything from everybody. And uh, after six years, they can't really do it. So they would like to work together. And local government also would like to ask the herder user groups to manage their land and uh, collaborate with the government. So that's what I'm aiming. And then those are the two user groups that I have been working ever since 2006, which is in Weinsdorf and Ranch Loom. They're in the buffer zone of the, I mean, the Olantaga National Park. And then these are the ways that we've been sharing knowledge, Western science. Knowledge is the, you know, land managers from the local government and me, and everybody else wants to see the numbers. But the herders in the area that knows every inch of land knows their own way. So we are exchanging the knowledge so we could build this uni tool that we could call it inclusive tool. So these are the meetings that we've organized and um, the knowledge exchange happens sometimes on, the, on this little <laughs> Uh, cloth board that we've created about the quality of the soil and pasture, how we can uh, graze the animals that is sustainable and how we can manage it as a um, herder user group. So these are the little, you know, examples of what we've been working and now the local government and park and herders are somewhat in a cohesion. They are really happy to work together and they've been aiming for the local value-based management. So the park management plan for the next four years are actually using the tool of like, what is actually very important for locals. So that is a big step towards the con conservation efforts that's happening in Mongolia, I think. And um, with that, you know, you could see the maps that herders built themselves and then you could put the slides over and ask the park to come and put their management plan over it. So you can see where the conflict and where the you know, goal matching is happening. So these are the examples of how we are having the participatory ways of working together, not against each other. So with that, I would like to thank everyone who helped so far. And then this is one of the nice views that you could see if you're working in uh, in the valley. Great, thanks so much, Padma. Yeah, thank um, you. We're going to go over to our final speaker, and then we'll have a chance to address some questions. Um, so our final speaker is Dr. Olaf Jensen, who is currently Associate Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Center for Limnology. Great, thank you, Marissa. Um, so I, I'd like to shift over just to the east to Lake Hoopsigal itself, and uh, I'll point out that that uh, yak there was unharmed in the, the research here, uh, unlike Rebecca's poor yak. Um, so the the blue pearl or Lake Hoofsigal um, is the uh, 18th largest lake in the world by volume and uh, just an amazing place for research. I'm trying to get the presentation to shift here. There we go. Um, so, so my work has focused on Lake Hoofsigal itself, as well as its outlet, the Egg and Ore Rivers um, to the, the south and east there. Lake Hoofsigal is um, often overshadowed by its bigger sister, Lake Baikal, to the north and east there. Um, they're, they're both part of the same Rift Valley system, and Lake Hoofsigal is a few million years old and quite a bit smaller than Lake Baikal. I think if it wasn't in the same neighborhood as Lake Baikal, it would be much, much better known. Um, and so um, our work there at Lake Hoofsigal has been uh, taking place through a, a cooperative uh, Mongolian American um, initiative that we've called the Mongolian American Aquatic Ecology Research Initiative. 
Uh, it's been funded by a, a variety of um, uh, US federal and, uh, and nonprofit sources. And I just want to recognize one of my uh, most important collaborators there, uh, Dr. Bud Mensekin, uh on the, the right side there, weighing a fish. Um, and I'll, I'll point out for, uh, for any of the uh, students who are um, on the, the presentation today that we are hoping to do a, another field season next summer and are always looking for um, students, Mongolian and American, to uh, participate in the field work. So the, the, uh, the ideas that, that drew me to uh, Lake Hoopsigal when I started working there in 2007 were um, really about the difficulty of, of studying the impacts of climate change on aquatic ecosystems when climate change is only one of multiple interacting threats. So in, in many parts of the world, you have uh, climate change driving demand for hydropower development. Um, when we talk about uh, um, uh, carbon, uh, less carbon intensive uh, methods of energy development, we're, we're generally talking about hydropower, which makes up 75% of renewable energy uh, globally. Um, and, and then climate change is also um, undermining the productivity of many fish populations, making it increasingly likely for overfishing to happen. And, and so really when we try to study the direct impacts of climate change in most systems, we can't easily disentangle it from all of these other things that are happening. And uh, to me, um, like Hoosigal at first seemed like a, a wonderful place to um, try to study a, a pristine system uh, as a, a model system that we might use to understand what's happening in other places uh, that, that's not being impacted by, um, by all of these other things that are, that are happening elsewhere. And of course, uh, as, as I'll get to in the end, the more we, we know about uh, Lake Hoopsigal, the less I'm inclined to use words like pristine and model ecosystem. Um, but uh, that, that's what in initiated my interest in working there. Um, so th this is uh, the Blue Pearl, Lake Hoosigal, um, and it, it is uh, unique in not only its size, but also in the water clarity. So the, uh, the, the common metric of water clarity is the, the depth at which you can no longer see a, uh, a round disc that's about the size of a pie pan uh, called a secchi disc. And in most lakes that you might go to, it disappears somewhere between five and 10 feet, uh, a couple meters. In, in Lake Hoosigal, it commonly is visible 18 meters down. If you drop a coin into Lake Hoosigal, you can just watch it as it just disappears into the, uh, into the, the, the depths. Um, and, and so th this water clarity is, is due to the fact that the Lake Hoosigal watershed is quite small relative to the, the volume of water there. And so the amount of nutrients coming into the, the, the lake is relatively low compared to that volume. So you have these uh, incredibly clear uh, nutrient poor waters. Um, and that makes it, as I said before, a, a model system for the study of climate change, pristine and at equilibrium. It, you know, going into this, I, I assumed it was at, at, at equilibrium. It's a few million years old uh, geologically, um, but as we're finding out, it's uh, probably a lot younger than that biologically. Okay, first, um, the, the temperature uh, changes there in northern Mongolia have been incredibly rapid. So this is probably a familiar graph for many of you. This is the um, IPCC's uh, global uh, temperature anomaly reconstructions. And you can see that starting in about the mid 70s, there was a, a period of very rapid temperature rise. And if you look over that, that period of the last uh, 40 years or so, um, globally, the, the temperature rise amounted to a little more than half a degree Celsius. Well, in northern Mongolia, it's been more than three times as rapid. Over that, that same period, the temperature has risen a little bit more than two degrees Celsius. So if we want to study the, um, the impacts of climate change that is likely to happen over the, the coming decades in other parts of the world, we can go to Mongolia and it's, it's already happening there. 
Uh, and of course, it's, it's important to recognize that it's not just the, the warming. Uh, Clyde Golden at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia has shown um, pretty conclusively that uh, thunderstorms have become much more common uh, across much of northern Mongolia. Um, and I think we've, we've seen evidence of it like this. Uh, this is the aftermath of a, a fairly short thunderstorm in, uh, in the summer that's not a tributary, that's just a low spot in the landscape. So if, if this kind of, um, if this kind of uh, water pouring off of the landscape like that had been happening frequently over, over uh, many decades, uh, this would have been a, um, a stream valley. Instead, what you can see there from the, um, just from the, the, uh, the geology there, is that this is a fairly new uh, occurrence. And the, the uh, high frequency weather station data uh, support that, as well as uh, Clyde Goulden's interviews with uh, herders, 98% of whom um, told him that it had uh, gotten wetter in recent years. And too hot at the, the peaks of the summer temperatures. It, and um, from the point of view of a fish biologist, I'm a fish biologist, um, one of the, the interesting things that's happening there is it's, it's generally getting too hot at the, the peaks of the summer temperatures uh, for salmonids. Uh, some, some pretty wonderful salmonid diversity. That fish right there is the, uh, the taimen, Hucho taimen, the largest salmonid fish species in the world. Um, the record size for, for that species is about 100 kilograms, a little over 200 pounds and uh, two meters in length. And we don't see them that big in Mongolia, um, but they, they are quite abundant there, um, in part because of fish eating. Drawn um, uh, anglers to Northern Mongolia to, to target the, the, uh, the salmonids, including the, the taimen. So um, this is what temperatures have looked like in, in some recent uh, years here. And in general for salmonids, temperatures over about 18 degrees Celsius are stressful. And, and so you can see that they're starting to be, uh, in the summer, week-long periods or more uh, of, of those, those peak temperatures above 18 degrees. During these periods in the, in the rivers uh, surrounding Lake Cooksigal, the uh, salmonids will often head to the, the um, cold groundwater springs that are coming in. So they'll leave the main stem of the river and uh, seek thermal refuge in the springs. And, and one reason this is of particular concern is that the, the um, routine metabolism or the rate of oxygen use in fishes is generally an exponential function. So each additional degree Celsius means that the, um, the basic energy demands of the fish uh, to survive uh, increase exponentially. And we've um, been able to demonstrate this uh, experimentally with Grayling and Lenach in Mongolia uh, using streamside respirometry chambers. And so that means one of two things. I, either the, the fish um, start to grow more slowly because the, the basic metabolic costs are, are too low, or they have to increase their consumption in order to make up for this uh, increased energetic rent, you might think of it. Um, and, and so if, if they were to increase their consumption, we'd expect to see also increased competition among the, the salmonid species. Uh, we know from data using uh, a, a chemical technique called stable isotopes that there is a great degree of uh, overlap in diets between the, the salmonids, the, the Lenach and Grayling. Um, both of these uh, species are found in, in Lake Hoofsigal as well as in the, the rivers there. Um, so we, we'd expect that uh, increasing temperatures would, would result in increased competition between these species. Now, th there is some, some adaptive capacity. Um, the, these species would not have managed to persist as, as long as they, they have in, in this region were it not for some adaptive capacity. And in particular, in, in the deep cold waters of Lake Hoofsigal, uh, one adaptation is to alter your vertical distribution, go deeper if you need to get colder. Uh, the, the problem, of course, is that the food is at the surface. And uh, so the, the food's at the top and the, the water temperatures that are conducive for, for your survival are down deeper. And the, um, the solution is diel vertical migration. So um, juvenile hoofsigal grayling, which is a, a species that's found nowhere else in the world except um, uh, Lake Hoofsigal, 
uh, undergo small but distinct vertical migrations. So these are the depths at night uh, on the left-hand side of each chart um, and during the daytime on the right. And, and, and you can see that they're altering their, their distribution in the water column by about 20 meters uh, between day and night. And, and this allows them to take yeah. advantage of the food near the surface during the uh, nighttime and then during the daytime move deeper to waters that are uh, of a more suitable temperature. That's also exactly what the zooplankton are doing, which is uh, the, the primary food source for the, um, the Hoosigal grayling. In particular, some of the, the larger uh, zooplankton species are undergoing very distinct diagonal vertical migrations where they, um, they uh, go into the surface waters, the top 20 meters at night, um, where they can feed on the plant plankton, the phytoplankton. Um, and then during the daytime, most of them descend into deeper depths where there's less light and they're less vulnerable to, to predation. There's also uh, some adaptive capacity that comes through variation within a species. And uh, we, we've recently discovered that the, um, the Hoopsigal grayling is actually um, two fairly distinct uh, morphotypes. So um, we, we found this by looking at the stable isotope data, which separated out into two different pretty clear groups, almost non-overlapping. One of them uh, associated with uh, littoral or nearshore uh, carbon signatures, and one associated with offshore or pelagic carbon signatures. And so when we saw this, we, we wondered whether there was any, um, any other differences that, that separated these um, individuals that are feeding in the, in the open part of the lake versus those that are feeding near the shore. And uh, what we found was that indeed the, the bodies are quite distinct between these two groups. So the, uh, the number of gill rakers is higher for the group that um, feeds offshore on plankton. And their eyes are larger um, for, their, for, for their given body size, uh, which, which is a, an adaptation for spotting smaller uh, food items like, like plankton, particularly when they're largely feeding at night, uh, which is the time when they overlap with the plankton. So I think what we're, we're seeing here is, is potentially the, the emergence of two distinct subspecies, possibly the early stages of that kind of emergence, which, which might take uh, many thousands of years to actually develop into uh, species, or they might persist indefinitely as uh, two, two different morphotypes if they're not reproductively isolated. Okay, so now I want to just um, uh, tear apart a little of the, the assumptions that I, I made going in, this idea that Hoofsigal is a model system. Um, so there's this uh, fairly well-known relationship across uh, many different lakes where as the, uh, the size of the lake gets larger, the length of the food chain, the number of steps between the top consumer, the top predator, and the, uh, the plants at the bottom increases. Uh, that, that round uh, black spot there is Lake Hoofsigal. They, they obviously, uh, the plants and animals in Lake Hoofsigal didn't read this paper. They, they're doing something entirely different. Um, so, the, you know, the idea that we can use systems uh, like lakes as uh, sort of interchangeable units, I think, is, is highly suspect. Lake Hoofsigal is a unique place. We can learn a lot about Lake Hoofsigal, but not all of that knowledge will be transferable to other places. And I, I said it's a pristine system. It, it still is quite pristine in, in many ways, um, but we did a study on microplastics. Uh, this was actually uh, interesting. I had a, um, a new student, new grad student, who was coming to Mongolia with me for the first time, and he said he wanted to study microplastics in Lake Hoofsigal. And I thought, well, that's, that's an absurd idea. This is a, a, an incredibly pristine lake. There's only a few thousand people in the whole watershed. Um, you're not going to find anything. But then I stopped myself and I said, well, let me not, you know, let's, let's try it. Let's see. I don't want to stomp on this, uh, the, the student's first idea. And lo and behold, um, what he found was there, there's more microplastic in Lake Hoofsigal than in some of the Laurentian Great Lakes, the, the Great Lakes between the U.S. and Canada. Uh, it, it's of entirely different types and sources than the, the um, microplastics that are found in the Great Lakes. Um, in, in particular, in the Great Lakes, uh, for, for a long time, most of the microplastic was microbeads, which um, come from cosmetics and pass through sewage treatment plants. 
There are, of course, no sewage treatment plants around Lake Hoopsigal and probably not many microbeads in the cosmetics. Um, and so what we found was that most of the plastics are actually from consumer goods. So the, the breakdown of those um, ubiquitous plastic bags and, and bottles. Uh, another um, <clears throat> uh, finding that, that broke apart our idea of, of Lake Hoofsigal as a pristine system was um, investigating the amount of illegal fishing that um, is, is happening there. W within Lake Hoofsigal, uh, commercial fishing is illegal. So fishing with uh, gill nets uh, is um, officially illegal. Uh, and, and so we, we did a study trying to, um, trying to understand the amount of uh, this illegal fishing happening at Hoofsigal. And of course, this is difficult. You can't ask people directly about illegal activity and expect to get a good answer. Um, so we used a technique that is uh, common in such studies where we asked people first whether they um, fished with, with gill nets. Um, nobody fishes with gill nets. Um, and then we asked people whether any of their neighbors fish with gill nets. Everybody's neighbor fishes with gill nets. So that gave us a, a pretty good idea that it was, it was uh, ubiquitous. Um, what we also did was, uh, as we moved around the lake, um, we collected all of the gill net that we could find. And we did this in a very systematic way where um, one of the students would uh, take off from the boat as soon as we landed and uh, go jogging along the shore with a big bag over his back, collecting all of the plastic debris that he found most of that plastic debris was gill nets and he removed it all. And, and so that, that leaves you with the question, is this uh, all of this gill net that he found, which he found at every single site that he looked at, um, was it the result of many decades of buildup of plastics? These plastics don't go away. Um, so we repeated the study the, the following year and he found even more gill nets at these sites despite removing them the previous year. So this is not a, this is not a historical accumulation. This is the result of, of recent um, gill net fishing activity. And then in the background there, um, what that's showing is the, the average size of uh, fish of these uh, five different species that are, that are common in the lake um, over time, just from the beginning of our, um, our systematic sampling in 2009, and what we've seen is significant declines in, um, in body size for many of these species, including species like uh, roach and burbot, which are um, not generally eaten. Um, so uh, we're, we're also seeing um, impacts to populations of what are bycatch species, not, not specifically targeted. The, the grayling are probably the, the most common target. We, we've seen them frequently for sale on the roadside. Uh, and also in some of the supermarkets in, in Moron, um, often as, as smoked grayling. And finally, um, this idea of, a, of an ancient system that has had a long time to come to equilibrium um, is, is one that I think is uh, probably falling apart. Um, it, it is geologically an ancient system. Um, the estimates are uh, somewhere around three to five million years old. But when we, we use genetic techniques to look at how long it's been since the fish in Lake Hoofsigal separated from the same species uh, in the rivers connected to Lake Hoofsigal, the, the answer is um, somewhere uh, around or maybe slightly uh, before the last glacial maximum. So we found uh, answers typically around 5,000 to 25, 30,000 years ago. So, so biologically, um, these, these fish populations have only separated from the river quite uh, recently in, in evolutionary time scale. And I'll just stop there by, by acknowledging some of the, the many, many people, both uh, American and, and Mongolian students uh, and collaborators and funding sources that have been involved in this work. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. Great, thank you very much. Olaf, so much information about the lake and the fish and the social context. Um, yeah, so we wanted to go into, into questions. We did get some questions in the chat, but I also wanted to ask um, if, if any of the speakers got, um, did you get any questions directly chatted to you that you wanted to address? No? Yeah, I'll... Uh... I was, I was very curious about whether the Mongolian folks or their attitudes um, about the, uh, the animal, the, the, um, 
uh, you know, the what you might call it. I mean, it's I now he's slipped my mind but, that that uh, that uh, Rebecca was working with the, the Wolverine. Rebecca, your animal is is the um, the Wolverine. Wolverine. I don't know why it just, I couldn't bring it up. I kept seeing the darn thing. But you know, in the northern parts of North America, the Wolverine has a very uh, kind of a checkered history, uh, not generally uh, appreciated by uh, not only modern trappers and hunters and so on, but also by many of the native people and so forth. So I just wondered if, if the Wolverine has, uh, you know, a similar uh, kind of a persona in Mongolia among the native people there. Yeah, you know, wolverines, of course, um, they do have this reputation as these sort of almost diabolical tricksters in a lot of northern cultures. And in Mongolia, there's such a strong relationship with the wolf that when I, when I started asking questions about the wolverine, I was really hoping to come across these kind of very strong cultural associations with wolverines as well as wolves. But um, you know, I got everything from, oh, that's a hirguyamtung, like literally that's just a useless animal, like why are you studying it, to, you know, oh, wolverines are cool, but they're, they're kind of like the, this animal that, um, you know, is associated with Erlikhan, the, the king of the underworld, um, so, you know, they're a little suspicious and we don't know what we think about them, to, um, you know, people who were personally really interested in them and impressed by their their um, endurance and their ability to just go and go and go across the landscape. Um, but I, I don't think they have quite the same kind of, uh, you know, cultural association that they do in areas further to the north where, where wolverines are really one of the like major predators on the landscape. There's a little bit of association with shamanic practice in, um, in the Darhad. Uh, they are used, the pelts are used for um, certain rituals and you know I've, I've seen one instance of a monument where uh, wolverine pelt was clearly associated with uh, protecting the border of a, of a national park in central Mongolia but I don't think it's it's not as clear-cut as wolves in Mongolia or wolverines in, in other more northern areas. Do they respect the animal and they, they appreciate it or, or do they have this idea of, a, of its being a spoiler? Yeah, there's the, there are stories, especially amongst the Duca, who I who I talk to, of wolverines breaking into hunting caches and just parking uh, in these hunting caches and going through like the entire carcass of a moose over the course of of like three weeks. They just they they envision the wolverine sitting in there eating the entire moose carcass and and just you know kind of yeah pillaging the supplies of of people. And then I had one story which I. I still can't totally figure out how serious this guy was, but he told me that, that a wolverine had broken into a gear in central Mongolia and had eaten all the borts and then gotten drunk off all the irig and then uh, left before the family came back. So there definitely is that, that kind of idea that they, they break into places and, and wreck people's things. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah, we actually just had quite a few questions uh, come in here. Um, so let me let me see if I can. Uh... May, may I have a question mm -hmm. to uh, Olaf Jensen to uh, his um, impressive uh, presentation of these uh, fish fauna. Uh, Olaf, you are talking about uh, Tumalus in uh, the hoof school a lot. Uh, did you have any idea about Corrigonus, which is even too very common and which is uh, sold, maybe that you mean this Corrigonus, which is smoked, uh, yes. sold, smoked, smoked in, in Ulaanbaatar. But you have a fish, yeah, let me say a fish industry uh, of uh, tinned fish uh, in glasses or in tins. Uh, uh, in what you can buy at Nomin or uh, everywhere here in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, however, this is Corrigonus and not Tumalos. Yes, th thank you for the, the question, uh, Michael. Um, so the, the Thymalis is the, uh, the grayling, um, and the, the Corrigonus, uh, probably most well known as the, the Omul in, uh, in Lake Baikal. Um, and uh, there's an interesting history there um, where um, Dr. Dulma, who is a uh, famous uh, Mongolian fish biologist and the, the former uh, prime minister's mother, 
um, introduced uh, Omo in, in many different places in Mongolia, including at least three introductions into Lake Hufsigal, uh, but they never seem to have taken off. They were, they were present for a while. Um, the, the ones that were introduced seem to survive, but they don't seem to have um, reproduced successfully. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, many of the, the fish that you find in markets uh, farther away from Lake Hoopsigal are, are indeed Corgonus, um, but the ones that are most common in the Hoopsigal region itself, as, as far away as Morun, um, as far as I've seen, I haven't done a systematic uh, survey of it, but in the, in the, um, the, the gear camps around uh, Lake Hoopsigal and um, in the supermarkets in Morun, uh, it's largely the grayling by Malice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you have any, sorry, when I have a, a, a very brief question, again, uh, additional question, um, uh, do you have any evidence for uh, these, um, yeah, put uh, these, these fish, yeah, that's like something like fish breeding uh, from uh, Miss Dulma, I know her very well, um, uh, in, in Hoof School, I think it's it's not an uh, original fish in, in Hoof School, this Corrigonus. In, in Baikal, uh, Omul is uh, original. That, that's right, yes. So uh, Dulma introduced the Omul several times uh, from Baikal into Hoof School, but it never took off. Um, so now, as far as we can tell, it's not present at all in Hoof School. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump back to the beginning of the panel really quickly and ask a question we got um, about deer stones, which also relates to sort of conservation and protection issues. Um, so the, the questioner asked, how, how do we keep them accessible but protected? And they commented on how, how impressive it is to see them just kind of out in the open, open like that in your photographs. I think that question is for Bill, but I think we yeah. all uh, Dana, know. Hey, Dana, you're talking about the about the frequency of deer stones, or uh, how uh, just just I think the question is about like how are they being, are measures being taken to, uh, yeah, how, basically the the person just said literally how how is preser preservation of the deer stones affected right. to just kind of have them out on the open step. <clears throat> Well, yeah, well, they've been out there for 3,000 years and, and sometimes even longer than that. So it's pretty amazing when you, when you see them. And we can tell when they have uh, fallen over and been picked up. And that's happened in the last uh, maybe 30 years. The Russians started doing it. And then uh, more recently, uh, uh, they, there's been a program at the National Museum to re-erect them uh, and put them into the correct order because you can always tell if they've been moved because usually people won't put the east facing side the facing the right way. So it's quite easy to tell uh, if they've been moved. Um, and you know a lot of them are, are damaged by frost, uh, by, uh, by the elements, by the sun, and so forth. And so the, the ones that are uh, coarse grained granite, uh, many of the carvings are uh, almost illegible today. That big beautiful one at Ercole I showed you to start with uh, the carvings there are almost completely worn off uh, just from frost fracture and, and, and uh, thermal fracture and so forth. Um, but surprisingly, many of them are in really wonderful shape uh, and uh, the local people tend to protect them. We had times when uh, local folks would come when we were digging and uh, uh, we would always be you know, meeting the villagers wherever we could and tell them what we were up to, but sometimes people would come by and ask us, what the devil are you doing to our old stone men? And that was just a couple of young kids at one time. Uh, so there's, a, there's, a, there's local protection. Uh, there is no real national protection for them. Uh, they're just scattered about the countryside. Uh, there have been a few that have been vandalized, uh, especially out in Western Mongolia. Many of them have been vandalized by graffiti and so forth, and they're in very, very bad shape. Out there, the stone they're using is softer, uh, more of a slate rather than granite. Uh, or by or uh, basalt, <clears throat> so it's it's variable, um, and it is amazing when you think of all the cultures that traveled back and forth in the wars and fighting in local local and national squabbles that 
that many of these are, are still standing. We estimate about a third of them that ever did exist are still standing. There's probably almost 3,000 deer stones that existed at one time. Many of them today are, are, have fallen and are buried, and we find them near the surface or at the surface. Um, there needs to be a more, more of a national program of protection uh, because uh, it's, it's too easy to pick them up and either damage them and deface them, uh, even in some cases pick them up and, and, and try to cart them off to China or something like that. But, you know, uh, overall they're in really pretty, pretty amazing shape. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, I'm going to go to a question for Bhadma. Um, they wanted, uh, the questioner is interested in more information about um, how laws towards ninja miners should be enforced. And they also uh, tagged on a second question about um, the privatization of land, of herders' lands, and what your opinion is on that. So I would like to start from the second one, the privatization of the land in Mongolia. If it happens, the nomadic culture of Mongolia is going to end that day. So I am personally against um, land privatization because we can see what happened by privatizing and fragmentizing the land. Any research that um, they've done that when you cut it off and just, you know, part. So anyways, we have big enough land for only 3 million people if no one migrates into Mongolia after all this COVID. So uh, I don't think we are going to do that, hopefully. So uh, from that, to manage the ninja miners, how to cover them, is again, you have to be working with the local people, people who are observing, working, learning, and taking care of the land every day are the people who are herders, which herders and locals. So we really need to work with them, not against them or exclude them. So it's coming back to my point that we need to have the user groups, we need to have the ways to manage or organize the local groups and empower them and use and respect their way of knowing and using the land and incorporate it into Western science knowledge. So it's gonna use, you know, best of both worlds. So that's what I would like to say. Thank you, definitely a very um, important topic on lots of, lots of people's minds. Um, I have a question also for, let me see. We got a lot of questions sort of, <laughs> sort of coming at us really quickly now. Um, let's see here. Oh, well, this is a good question for everybody um, that just came in uh, about deforestation. Um, have there been, this person says that they've worked in- Mr. Robin in Talbert. <clears throat> Thanks, Robin. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, having, worked in, having worked in Huskal IMAG, I've seen uh, extensive deforestation um, and cutting. Uh, and uh, I, the company I was with, we tried to get uh, the assumed to uh, replant trees, and we unfortunately paid the money up front and went to buy a car. Um, so, is, has there been any attempt? This is in 2013 I'm talking. Has there been any attempt since then to encourage planting, uh, replanting trees uh, to replace those that have been cut down as they do in where I am in BC? It's a requirement that if you cut trees, you must replant. And it's, I think it's the same in the States. I don't know who should answer that. But. If I may, I, um, I might tell you what is happening in the area where we work. So uh, the, again, the user groups or the, the local they call, but it's, it's the other way of co-ops and stuff. 
So they are trying to initiate this local groups of people who are managing the forest, you know, cleaning it and protecting it. At the same time, uh, you know, trying not to have the legal harvesting happen. So that's one of the initiatives that I know personally, but I don't know if anyone else knows more of the initiatives. Uh, may I um, give a hint to this? Uh, we have since those years you mentioned, Robin, uh, an initiative by the GI set uh, countrywide uh, to implement uh, forest law, uh, which is regulating uh, the uh, forest use and to support the forest user groups. Maybe this could be a good address uh, to get more information about the uh, use of the forests, even too in, in Hoof School. Uh, but uh, I was not involved in this project. And uh, however, there had been a, a lot of initiatives, um, as far as I remember, by the uh, German uh, GIZ. Uh, may I have this uh, possibility, a brief question to Olaf again. Uh, uh, sorry, Olaf. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation uh, a lot of climate uh, issues. Um, the, it's very nice to have this uh, IPCC uh, uh, curve, but uh, we are talking here about regional or better to say local uh, uh, aspects. Um, beside uh, Hank and uh, Hatgal, do you have more uh, climate stations there what you can use? Yes, there, there are a few others. Uh, there's one in Morun. Um, oh, okay. and, That's uh, more far away. <laughs> yes, right, right. In terms of right around Hustigal, no, those are, the, those are the two. With the exception of one that has been maintained by a um, project uh, Dr. Boldgiv um, has uh, from the National University of Mongolia. Uh, there's been a site there maintained on the eastern shore of Hoopsigal since about 2000. In the old area of Clyde. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and we want, uh, this year we want to install on Mount Saridak another station. Fantastic, great. Yeah. Okay, thank Even you. Even less is known about the, uh, the water in, in Lake Hoopsigal. There's been very little monitoring of the, um, the water temperatures or conditions there. Yeah, there, there were um, joint Soviet-Mongolian expeditions for many years, starting in the 60s. Um, but uh, much of that data has apparently been lost. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, maybe for everybody, I can give a, a little bit more information about the work of the UNESCO. Uh, maybe that some of you know that um, the UNESCO have an initiative uh, to appoint uh, Hoof School as a World Heritage uh, Site. Uh, the reasons for this are exactly mentioned by uh, Olaf already, uh, because uh, uh, this could be a very good model for uh, a pristine uh, aquatic ecosystem. <clears throat> and uh, we are working uh, even too by the UNESCO uh, in these terms uh, right now or recently, uh, and uh, have even too had some workshops there with the uh, local people um, and so on. Um, Marisa, you are the, the boss of the discussion. <laughs> I have even two, uh, two other remarks, not questions. Uh, may, may I uh, give those remarks? I, I think you should, because you know, you're, you're, I'm learning a lot from you, and you are, let's consider okay. you an informal member of the panel, because you have a lot to share. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, very brief remarks. Um, uh, one is for uh, Rebecca. He hello, Rebecca. Uh, I think we know each other from, from Mongolia. <laughs> and uh, I'm very curious and I'm very eager to learn more about uh, the scientific results of your um, expeditions. You have had uh, really very nice days, uh, give excellent photos. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, from my uh, long-lasting scientific experience. It's only the first step, only in brackets, uh, and I'm very eager to learn more about the uh, uh, DNA uh, analysis of this, uh, how the uh, families uh, of wolverine, for instance, or maybe for of wolfes, uh, when you uh, put uh, focus on this, <clears throat> uh, to learn more about this. 
uh, so uh, please keep in touch uh, and I'm yeah. very uh, I'm very um, uh, interested in the uh, research results and uh, another thing is a remark uh, to Madame Garaf uh, where is Madame Garaf oh, I don't see her <laughs> um, I'm even to hear uh, this uh, for sure community based um, research um, is mostly common in Mongolia and you can see in the uh, international organizations which are focusing on uh, conservation um, engagement uh, that uh, the uh, community based uh, research is a, let's say sexy word uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, it's always used in every application form. We must be uh, community-based. Uh, otherwise, we have no chance uh, to, to write any project proposal if it's not community-based. But, uh, and you show us, at, I think it was your, uh, last, um, your last slide, what you show us, uh, the um, uh, suggestions of the different interests of the user groups and of the, the interest of the uh, national park. Um, what, but you, I, I miss a little bit, what is the consequence of this community-based um, uh, discussions, what you made? And uh, this even too would be very interesting. Are there any consequences? Are there consequences by change of the regulations of the land use or uh, anything of this? And this, uh, the other very important thing is, uh, is are these regulations put into practice? Uh, that means the implementation of this. Uh, I think this is uh, the crucial point. We have many ideas in Mongolia uh, and we are not uh, uh, free of any ideas, but we are, have a big lack of implementation and a practical application. And this is the problem. We have brilliant laws in Mongolia. You know this better than me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, even to that's not a question, it's only a remark uh, of this. Maybe that you can have uh, to say one sentence about the uh, application. And thank you. And now I shut up. Yeah, thank you. So um, the community-based participatory research or anything community-based is, yeah, it is sexy. And it's been going over a decade. Like, you know, there's a big group of people um, from the Colorado State University, which is uh, community-based natural resource management. And there's so many initiatives, but all those initiatives, they come with their own packet. They come with their own plan and they enforce it over the herders. That's what I would like to, you know, it might sound harsh, but that's what, that's the sole reason why it's not succeeding. So that's why I had to go and talk to the herders, ask 160 people what they really value, what they really need to do in, in their uh, situation. So in my case, I feel like, um, it's more like it's coming from the local people than it's coming from me or some World Bank or whoever has an idea of privatizing Mongolia into parcels. So I think, you know, consequences are coming because the park that we have is only six, seven years old, maybe eight years old, if we just, you know, count the first year. So it's not like hundred years tradition that we are trying to break. And also the head of the park, Tumursuk is great. He's an amazing person who is open for new ideas. And um, we've already had first three meetings with the local people about how to incorporate local value into the management. So the management plan for 2020 to 2004, I mean 24, the next four years round is the pre-talk, the meetings, community meetings are happening. So that is the first few con consequences. And also um, local government in, in those counties in the Dhaka Valley, four zones, they, they were just throwing their hands up in the air saying, we don't know what to do with these herders because they're not following what we wanted them to. And then when they come up with their idea, like we would like to be included but we would like to use our knowledge into the management and our team of herders into the management. With the, we would like to help you and you guys need to help. 
So this is, I think it's one of the big steps that's going towards how park and local people and local government can work together if they actually listen to each other. And, you know, there are so many uh, projects that had big funding, big, you know, teams of work, but always the idea came from somebody, maybe it sounds weird, foreigners would come and inject the idea into a Mongolian herders. And now it's coming from the other way. So I think that's why it's unique. That's why it's succeeding so far. And that's why we have this group of amazing people who are working together. So I, I think we have a little light at the end of the tunnel. Great, thanks Padma. I think um, Rebecca also um, had some stuff to answer towards that question. And I also I wanted to turn the mic over to Rebecca to ask Paula um, a question about some of those ovos. And I think also about hunting. Um, I think since this is a, a panel about a particular area of Mongolia where hunting is, is a big deal, we should take the opportunity to, to maybe go a bit deeper into that. And of course, fishing, but we've also gone very well into fishing, so. Yeah, I, I guess um, to the question about the research results, I'm happy to stay in touch um, and, and send those as they come out. I can send a paper we've published on bird surveys and um, also can send more information about the results of the DNA stuff for wolverines. But I am really interested in um, Paula's work on the outdoor worship sites, particularly the intersection between ovos and hunting practices. Um, so I, I, she, she mentioned, uh, you mentioned Paula, uh, uh, Silik Indawa, the ovo that's up at Silik as the hunting ovo. And I'm just curious about other ovos and hunting and whether there's a specific set of practices that go with um, that particular ovo as pertains to hunting and whether you see hunting practices at other ovos as well. So really just hunting and ovos, curious so, about that. So just to say this, Silik, uh, Sailor Dava is the place where sable are hunted. And this is uh, the locations where the Batu hunts were done, which were the group hunts with droving. So this is a huge activity. And one of the things is that this is where all of the young boys first go. So this is their first group hunting experience. And this is very important. And so that's why everyone wants to leave a piece of themselves at this ovo. But there's a whole ritual that involves, traditionally involves hunting. And you, uh, you have to first do worship and do uh, smoking of your, yourself and your guns before you leave home. And then there are things that you must say because you must tell the animals that this wasn't intentional and it wasn't mean. And that's very important. So you have to, and often this is seen as a song that's sung. And in Tuvan, there have been some transcriptions of the hunting songs. So they, they have a little song or a little saying now that they do as they, as they wait and as they hunt. It's, I really need this food for my children. I didn't intend to hunt you. I didn't mean I'm sorry. And so there's this gift and exchange and excuse and apology kind of situation that goes on. There's actually two hunting ovos. But the other one is at Charger, which is on the Delgar Maroon, closer onto the border. That one I've been to and it's not as well developed. I was really disappointed. It didn't have hardly any artifacts when I went there. I think it hasn't been used recently. But then there's one other hunting ovo that I visited in southern uh, Hovsgol IMAG near oh, Galt. In the Galt area, there's a hunting ovo as well. That one also, and what all of them share is they will have uh, the kind of things that are carved is you will have guns, often very accurate guns with, and then they will have bullets there that fit in the guns. Sometime if they have it done very clever, you'll be able to actually put the bullet into the wooden gun in the carving. But then they'll also have carvings of all of the animals that they anticipate hunting. But then they'll also have these plaques and the plaques are commemorative and tend to list the names of everyone that went on a trip and will show some kind of scene if you've seen those. Then they'll also have things about their horses. So one of my guides, every time he went to the hunting ovo at Selagdava, he would put a tie a ribbon onto the horse of his jarrel, the carving, 
plaque of his Daryl horse, his pacer style horse, which they want to have if they're true gentlemen and get around easily. Uh, so all of these things are there. Even one time there was a small poem that said, foolish man, why are, you why are you sitting here smoking when you could be home with your Uyghur wife? Your mother-in-law is out of town. And they read all of this and really laughed. So they have lots of time in these hunting ovos. And so this carving and other kind of male bonding things are what goes on there. They typically wait until the first snow and take the reindeer because the reindeer are so much easier to go. We went in the summer. You can go on horses. It's not too bad. I know that you went very close to Saligdava on your track. I didn't know that was you, but I kind of know the track that you followed there. And um, so it's, it's a very beautiful, beautiful location and used almost exclusively for hunting. But this area was not until 1986, the place where West Taiga was located. So before that time, they were actually in the Ulan Ul area. And because of traditional herder disputes were driven out of that area with their reindeer and then spent two or three years searching for a place and settled back in, in this area. Salig Dava was home to traditional families, one or two. And you can still meet the people that were raised there occasionally. When I asked them how old the hunting ova was, they said very definitively that it was uh, from 1923. This is during the time when, um, when the government, the, the Manchurian government has failed, they've become independent. And then in 1923, they go into a new government configuration which requires them to have to raise money to pay tribute and taxes again. So they had to start hunting for fur-bearing animals to get the money to pay the taxes. So that's why they pinpoint this as a problem they had to solve by hunting. Wow, thank you. That's really interesting. I would love to talk with you more about this mm -hmm. at some point. And, and so like the hunting, this hunting ovo is so special uh, but the groups all, if you remember the names, I just want to tell you that the main group that I work with is Balish, and they are all about fishing. Underline, underscore, everything is about fishing. There's others that have as their clan icon, the Adig uh, Balish. Adig is actually the uh, Tuvan word for bear. So they're the bear clan. The bear fishing clan. And they talk about exactly what that means. So all of them have hardwired into their names an occupation that has to do with their specialization in hunting. Well, I don't suppose, I, I don't know Tuvan, but um, Balik is sort of like a Turkic word for fish. Yes, it's, well. it's yeah. all Turkic. It's all, all Tuvan is Turkic and that's the the language, they have a complete mixture for their sacred sites and their practices. So you will see all of the terms, but yes, they're, it's, it's just straight out Turkic. Wow, thank you. Um, uh, so we, this is, I think, a good question maybe to open up to everybody as well, um, but was particularly posed to Olaf. Um, which he mentioned the, the Eggingol Dam project, of which there have been various versions of. Um, and I don't know, uh, Chimi Docher, if you're on the call, maybe you want to just jump in and, and ask your question yourself? If you have a mic. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Marisa, for giving me a chance to ask a question. So I, I have a, a same question as Alten Girl Saksaha. To all of us, is there any, you know, is, um, I would like to uh, hear the all of opinion on ecological respect to egg dam uh, and its impact to Hoofsko Lake. Great, and I, I would love to hear Thank updates you. about the uh, Egg and Gold hydropower project from anyone in Mongolia who knows about this now. But um, uh, from 2013 to 15, um, I was doing some work on uh, ecological impacts of the Egg and Gold Dam near the dam site. So this is a uh, proposed hydropower dam that I think 
was first proposed in the 60s. It's a, um, a fairly obvious site for a hydropower project um, just from the, the, the landscape topography. Um, and uh, it went as far as some initial construction of roads to the area happening in, uh, in 2016 before um, uh, Russia uh, got it shut down um, by prevailing on China to, to withhold the loan. Um, in terms of the ecological impacts, um, to, to Lake Hoofsigal, I'm not sure that they would be especially significant. But to the, um, the ecology of the, the Egg River, they would be quite severe. Um, so uh, th there's a, a whole suite of different impacts, but I think one of the, the most obvious ones is that it's unlikely that um, over the long term, the population of Taiman would persist there because they would, um, they would end up being cut off from other populations of Taiman. So um, no possibility for genetic exchange, no possibility for um, what's called demographic rescue, where if the population gets low, uh, immigrating fish from elsewhere could recover it. Uh, and and uh, Taiman are not a species that can survive in lakes. Um, so they, they often live in rivers right up to the very edge of the lake, but not in the lake itself. Um, so they're, they're unlikely to be able to survive and do well in the, um, the reservoir, the proposed reservoir. So, um, you know, we were doing a whole bunch of work related to the dam, um, and, and then it, it, the, the plug was pulled on it, and, and we've not focused on that yet. So I'd be very curious to hear more about what's, what's happening there, whether that's being revived or not. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Robin Talbert is raising his mm -hmm. hand. Your finger. Yeah, yep, go ahead, Robin. I know you had another question. Okay, um, it's, it's a comment and question at the same time. I have been in Mongolia from 2005 through 2013, probably be going back again. Um, my background is I'm a geologist and uh, I was brought up on a farm in Scotland and uh, I saw uh, changes to the river systems based on the changes in farming practices in Scotland, basically from hedge, hedge road farm uh, fields to huge fields for uh, intensive uh, grain farming, particularly barley for beer. And that resulted in the average uh, height of the river dropping, uh, becoming deoxygenated, lots of weed, and the fish changing from trout grayling, which require oxygenated waters, uh, to salmon to uh, roach and perch, which I've never seen before. So the same thing I've seen in, in Mongolia, in, um, in the river, uh, um, the Tess. Looks like we have just lost Robin here. Hmm. Justin, he was talking about fish. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. He had a, some questions in the chat, but I think he actually hadn't finished typing it. So I don't know what he was going to ask. So meanwhile, I'll ask a quick question. Yeah, so, go ahead. You, yes, <laughs> Thanks for your talk. And how do you, how many populations do you think are there in Mongolia? And then, uh, what is the biogeographical origin of the Wolverine versus Palearctic in Arctic? Yeah, the the population number question is quite tricky because you know even in the U.S. where we've put we've put GPS collars on these animals and tracked them and done extensive genetic studies across the entire lower forty eight we have really bad population estimates. So um, I am really, really hesitant to actually state a number because once you say a number in public, people latch onto it and then that's the end of it and people just wanna talk about the numbers. So I'm not gonna give you a number, but I am going to say that compared to the population in the US Rockies, I think that the population in Mongolia is pretty robust just based on detection. Uh, ease of detection. You know, if you want to find a wolverine in the United States in the lower 48 and you set out and ski through wolverine habitat, you're going to be lucky if you find a single track. 
uh, over the course of two weeks of skiing or a month of skiing. We found tracks on the first day within 45 minutes on both of our expeditions and we detected wolverine tracks on almost every day thereafter across those expeditions. So I, I think they're doing well, but I'm, I'm hesitant to actually state a number. Um, the biogeographical origin, uh, as far as I know, um, at the, at the current state of knowledge, wolverines probably originated in Eurasia. There's an ancestral species called a plesioguo that is found, um, actually there are uh, fossils of that species that are found as far south as, as North Africa, I think. Um, those, but that ancestral species is also found in North America. So I think that there was a, a fairly um, consistent exchange uh, during times of glaciation when the, the land bridges were in existence. Um, and the current species, I, I can't say definitively, but, but to the best of our knowledge, they actually originated in Eurasia and, and came across you know, um, on, the, on the land bridge and, and gained their current circumboreal distribution. They are the same species in North America and Eurasia. There are different subspecies, but they are, as far as we can tell, you know, they have the same haplotypes and, you know, they're genetically pretty similar. So, yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you. Hmm. Was there anyone else who uh, wanted to, to get a question in? I, I've lost a little bit of a track, a little bit, I've lost track of the of the text chat box a little bit, so feel free to jump in. So I have another question. If no one has a question, uh, from William Fitzel. Sorry about the butchering the name. Um, so great talk, by the way. And uh, is there anyone working on the archaeopathology or uh, infectious disease perspective on those burials? I mean, have you guys been excavating? Uh, those burials or remains from this ancient uh, era. And uh, in a, as an archaeopathological perspective, you mentioned about Eskimos. Uh, I, I read a papers on those Eskimos or specifically that infected with certain parasites called pinococcosis in the Alaskan side in, in the Anchorage, I think. Uh, there were about 70% of those population were infected with this, uh, this disease. and. Uh, also, in an archaeopathological perspective, you can detect that from looking at the remains of the burials. Uh, has anyone worked on that in the uh, reindeer uh, people in that northern part of the uh, um, Polyarctic and Siberia and Mongolia? So that is my question. Yeah, um, <clears throat> no, I don't think there uh, has been any study. The, the, uh, uh, skeletal material that's been recovered from the from the Mongolian uh, graves, and this is, I mean, there are graves that are known from about uh, maybe even 8,000 years ago, you know, up until recent times. Um, a lot of those collections are in the National Museum, uh, the Univer National Mongolian University. They have a, a special unit there that studies them, and um, there have been some paleo um, uh, studies of paleo disease, uh, but it's been pretty uh, undeveloped as a, as a field, and there's not a lot of uh, active research going on right there now. Um, the the um, there's really there's really no genetic evidence of any of the you know work on gen on uh, disease uh, genetics and so forth. Most of the interest in the paleo material and the early skeletal material is trying to figure out the the east versus west, you know, uh, components, uh, how much European uh, Caucasoid type material and how much Mongoloid and, and so forth. And uh, it, it's you're right on the boundary zone between where you get a lot of, uh, uh, you know, pronounced differences between those two, two uh, sort of genetic bases. Um, so there's, there's going to be, a, I'm sure, a lot of new research done now that there's DNA work to, to uh, uh, search into this stuff. But it's really, at this point, it's not a very uh, developed field in the, in the Mongolian area. And there haven't been very many, uh, you know, European or American researchers uh, yet uh, bringing those techniques and samples. Uh, Paula may know a little bit more about it, but 
Bruno Froelich is one of the ones from the Smithsonian who's done a lot of work. Um, and um, there's been more interest in looking at some of the isotope studies to see, you know, things like where the horse is coming from. Uh, sometimes there's periods when horses seem to be originating uh, from Western Mongolia and other times from Central Mongolia. Some of that type of work has been done. Uh, but, uh, and I, I really don't know how to answer your question about the Eskimo diseases uh, from Anchorage, uh, but it's clear that there is a lot of, you know, genetic connections going across uh, all the way starting around uh, 4,000 years ago, Asian groups were coming into Alaska and spreading out across North America, even to Greenland. Uh, and Mongolian uh, genes were, I'm sure, very much involved in a lot of those transfers. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one more question. What do you think about the, uh, uh, they're trying to find the uh, Chinggis Khan's burial and Mongolian people aren't divided and have somebody should find it or someone says should it leave it alone. What is your opinion on that? Leave it alone. <laughs> I know there's been a lot of, you know, there always seems to be the foreigners coming into Mongolia who want to find Genghis Khan. And there's been quite a lot of, uh, stirred up quite a lot of problems. Um, I think that, you know, if you can believe the secret history that there's a lot of, uh, they were very careful to be, to, to uh, hide those remains and make sure that they stay uh, preserved wherever they are. Uh, I, I don't think very many people are, you know, professional people in archeology span and so forth. I don't think that it, it isn't likely that we're gonna be the people pushing for that. It's more, much more uh, some of these, uh, fantastic characters who, who want to uh, do something spectacular and, and uh, that's you know that whatever happens there should be done by the Mongolian people and they should they should be the ones to make that kind of decision. I'd like to continue if I could uh, with a question to Olav and Badamgarov if I may. I was cut off. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Glad that you so, made it back oh, where, where, where I was at was that uh, eight, the, the University of Oregon study has shown that 80% of the land has been degraded with overgrazing. I think people can see that. I saw that right from the get-go in 2005. Um, and the another factor there is the Russians, when they were in the land, there were there's all these places. Like the first place I saw it was uh, Mandelgold with these big sheds, and I wonder what they're all empty. What are those? And those were apparently for st storing fodder for the winter. That practice has stopped, and so what's happened is the and, and you can look at the statistics. The herd herd uh, sizes have grown immensely, immensely, particularly goats, because of the demand for cashmere. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, the Chinese are buying volume versus quality. There, I met a um, agronomist uh, in Bayanogi who was trying to convince the herders to improve the quality of their cashmere. But unfortunately, the Chinese aren't paying for quality, they're paying for volume. And so the only way they can make money is to make their herds bigger. And in fact, I was speaking to somebody in uh, uh, Saganulsum who won an award, uh, best herder. And I said, well, what, what do you have to do to be the best herder? You have to have a huge herd. So there's this huge herding going on. So what it's doing is it's uh, degrading the grassland and it's affecting the rivers. And then, because I talked again to the old folk because the grass in abundance uh, retains the water as it did the same sort of thing was happening in Scotland. The water level would be before would be here with lots of grass, and then now it's gone down. So uh, that then affects the fish. So the other aspect is with this overgrazing and the lack of uh, collecting fodder, you have these huge herds, and when it comes to the winter, when it gets cold, they can't feed them. And when the zuds come, there's a huge die off, like 25% of the herds in one year. And, uh, you know, it's being blamed on climate change, but uh, the climate is changing. But at the same time, it's brought on by this, this huge, uh, if you look at the statistics again, Olaf and Madame Garf, 
you'll see that the, the herds have uh, grown immensely and it's beyond, I think, the capability of the land, obviously, because 80% of it's being degraded. So uh, how do you factor those into your thoughts about climate change? And because those are real effects brought on by the changing herding practice. Uh, I'll jump in, Robin. Thank, thanks for the, the question. Um, in terms of the the area that I, I work primarily on the Egg River, uh, we, we have not seen those um, big changes to the herd size. Um, I, I understand, I'm aware of those statistics, and I, I don't doubt that they're accurate. But in the in the immediate um, area around the the Egg River between say Morun and the um, confluence with the Salang, we, we've done a lot of interviews there, and there, there's certainly been in the last decade, I would say, a transition from um, goats to uh, cows, um, as you know, following the the collapse of cashmere prices. Um, it, the the herd sizes uh, don't seem to have have grown um, that much around the river. There there's certainly erosion um, going on, but it, it's hard to separate how much of that erosion is from this uh, this pattern of increased thunderstorms versus the um, the overgrazing and I think they're 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 quite closely related right so when when you get the same amount of precipitation coming down in thunderstorms it, it runs off into the river it takes a lot of soil with it and it doesn't soak into the ground so it exactly. it, it yeah. results in drought like conditions even though the same amount of, of water is coming down um, and, and is, is, as I said, much, much worse in terms of soil erosion. Um, so I, I don't know how to separate that from uh, overgrazing without having more information about um, local densities of, of the herds over time. Yeah, well, it's out there. You just Google it. You'll see the herds. It's, no, no, no. I mean, there's, there's plenty of information at the IMEG level for, for herd sizes over time. Um, but but that, tying that into local erosion is, is hard because of these confounding factors. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, for me, I actually work with the herders who are suffering from the exact same thing that you guys are talking, which is one of the herder group is right in the valley of this Delga River, which is the tame and fishing place. And then the topsoil is being washed down with the um, pattern change of the precipitation, which, you know, 365 days spread around precipitation is like coming down within two hours sometimes because of the all the climate change and it this is what the herders are observing and telling me that you know the the season is different the pattern is different at the same time we have too many animals so it is a mixture of a lot of things again i agree with all of with how we don't know how to separate those things yet but uh, we have to deal with it as a whole. So that's why um, having the park there in my area is really actually helpful in a way that we are trying to diversify the income of the herders from not only solely dependent on from the animals, but they can diversify helping the local fishing company or being guides so they can have different resource of income so, so eventually, hopefully they can reduce the number of animals they're herding. So that's what we're aiming, but it's really kind of hard to say, okay, we are going to give you this job so you can get rid of half of your animals. And at the same time that climate change, the warming, the seasonal change in, you know, having too short of a summer or too long of a winter, this is just, you know, we all have to work together. That's why the science has to be interdisciplinary. That's why we have to be all working together. Like, I need to be working with all of on the water quality because I'm interested in the topsoil. That's what I've studied my PhD. And then now it turned out into, I have to be working with the people. And then now I, I need to have the TEK specialists and I think Inktuya Odo has been, you know, saying that we really need to have the traditional ecological knowledge incorporated and documented before it disappears. That's what I agree. Like, I can't agree more with that. So we really need to use this 
field scientists, which are herders, doing the field work every single minute of their life and incorporate their knowledge into our research. That's, you know, that's the only way that we can work and manage it. Uh, I have a comment on that. Um, I think uh, the first thing that the government needs to do is to get rid of that Nyangat Malchin owner, that 1,000. And that was the leftover from a Soviet Union uh, reward for encouraging others to increase the population on, uh, on the government property. So that system is gone already. Uh, we need to move on to the next level. And also, I don't think it's uh, not a bad idea to uh, increase the tax on each uh, goat head uh, at least temporarily uh, for a while and then to see it go from there. Otherwise, you know, I heard this problem probably 10 years ago, 15 years ago, still there. So just my yeah, opinion. I have the, the numbers here. I just looked it up. The, the growth of goat population in Mongolia in 1992 was 5 million. 2018, 27 million. That's huge on a, on you, a fragile you grassland. You need to contextualize Sorry? that against the date because in 1992, the country was totally impoverished and there was a crash of their herds after the loss of the Soviet system. People okay, were- 1990, yeah, but if they, they would- People if, what, what was it? in 92. It wasn't so, much bigger. I've gone back further and it wasn't much different in terms of sizes. Yeah, but the thing is, in, in this northern area in Darhai, the herd size and the hunting are intimately connected. You, if you reduce the herd sizes, you push more into hunting. That's actually what's been one of the tension zones along the national park for the reindeer herders. Many of them feel that they've been cut off from their hunting lands. And then that means they have to rely too much on their reindeer. Then they have to, then they worry, then their reindeer go down because they're not supplementing their meat. So it's a meat issue for them. So you've, you've, you've got to figure out both sides of this puzzle. You don't want poaching going on. That's what happened after 92, was extensive poaching in this area. And the argument was whether it was the reindeer herders poaching or whether it was the, Dar, the Darhat ethnic group coming into their areas and poaching. With the park, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be honest the way I see it. I always look at the signs and I say, it's the four no's. You come to the park edge and it's, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And for the reindeer herders, this has been a real, a real struggle of trying to figure out how many of their reindeer they have to eat, which is more than just meat to them. It's milk, it's transportation. So their herd shrinks when they don't have the hunting. So you've got to stimulate and find out how this whole equation balances without just reducing herd size. You reduce herd size, you'll increase hunting. So that's you what's gonna happen in the You increase herd size, you're, you're getting exactly what we're saying, is and, and why, why I, not 80% of the land is degraded. But, but what I would tell you on the reindeer side. So when, when you're I talking in, about I, I, uh, wait, hold on, hold on, wait, I just wanna finish this. When I went in there, I thought that there was a limit to there would be an effective number of reindeer that could be handled in the area. But I tell you, I've seen so much area, I've seen thousands of miles of trail. There is endless amount of places to put reindeer. We're not running out of reindeer habitat. So you've got to actually look at that and see. What worries me is the loss of permafrost. And I think some of the erosion comes from that because the permafrost is the thing that knits all of this valley together underneath. So when you talk about Kashmir goat's number increase, that is not a problem that we have to look in the taiga because goats are not there. Goats are down in Gobi 
in central Mongolia. So even we had a crazy project a few years ago, I think it was Elbuk Dorj, they decided to give some goats to every reindeer herders. And on the way to the taiga, half of them were dead. When they get there, there's nothing for goats to eat and survive. And it was just one of those helicopter projects that they're like, okay, we'll give some 10 goats to each reindeer herder so they can sustain. And that was just so out of picture. And I was there to like, everybody was like, what are these goats doing in East West Taiga? Like in the winter after it was gone because they had to be eaten. Otherwise they would have been frozen to death. And then again, you know, when you're talking about number of herd, it's just, again, when you come down to the Darhat people, there's no problem with the reindeer herders because there's not many animals and that there's not many animals that would survive except reindeer up there. Even the permafrosting, because of that, they have to move upwards, which is, again, it's going pushing into Russian border. So when you talk about number of goats, it's probably problem. It's actually the the valley bottom problem, not the upper mountain problem. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Robin. No, I said I, I agree. I agree with that. It's I'm, I'm talking about the the uh, the, the sums I was at is Setzerleg and Saganul sums, which are yes, the valley bottoms. And uh, but the the effect of as I said the effect of overgrazing and Olaf is, agrees with that. I think you do both Olaf and Badamgarov Bad agree that when you get rid of the, the 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 grass and the roots, then which goats do, uh, then when you get heavy rainfalls, uh, the water doesn't soak isn't retained, and your average water level is down, and then you get these flash floods. Uh, because of that, the exact same thing happened in Scotland. They they put in, uh, they got rid of all the hedges in the, in the in the Merse, the Tweed and uh, Teviot Valley, and they made huge fields. They put in these porcel these uh, clay drains, and they drained into the rivers. And so what happened is the, the the water level went down on average, as I said, and the flash floods instead of slowly going up and then going down. You get this up and down with, a, with, a, with when a rainfall happens because there was nothing to retain the water. So we had these huge floods, uh, and that that same thing sort of thing I guess is happening in in uh, Husko and other places. Yeah, a horizon. The topsoil is the one that the sponge that holds everything, yeah. the vegetation, water, and everything. And when we lose it, it's like a human without a skin. Exactly. Yeah, that is just again, it's the climate change and our grazing and all the compounding factors that we have to manage. Holy. Yeah, so I, I, I just want to say know. one thing from a cultural perspective, Robin. Having traveled along the Tess River and been in the hot goid areas, they are the people of the goats. And on their ovos, they're putting necklaces of goat ears. So I'm not sure that goats are only recent in that area. I think it's baked into their culture. So they actually do lambs, and uh, there's a lot of imagery around lambs, ram's heads on their ovos, but goat's ears, especially when you get right north of uh, Morin. So wow. goats have been in there quite a while. And in fact, the name of that area is the origin of goat. So. Yeah, the southern range of the Muran city is Urshim, which is the name of the Kashmir goat breed, which is black goat. And again, it's, uh, it's when they refer to goats, in the old times, goat and sheep ratio in the herd was totally different. You know, there were only 10 goats within a 70 number of sheep. So there was this ratio. Now the ratio is also changed because of the cashmere. So I think again, the goat's ears on the ovos are thing, but it's mostly lamb's ears, you know, goat, sheep, they're they really similar. But again, it's just 
the free market economy and doing it to the private, I mean, public land. So, manage. Yeah, if I could, thank you. If I could interject here, I mean, it's a really good uh, discussion, both on, on, the, on the video panel and also on the chat box as well. And, and um, I just can't, can't help but feel that, you know, it's really important for uh, the field scientists to have a platform or a knowledge hub to sort of co congregate all their resources um, because at the end of the day, the main stakeholder that's sort of coordinating the policy of agriculture is the Ministry of Agriculture and, and um, Light Industries. And I have done, uh, I have been, I have done my share of um, international development projects involved with uh, urban uh, and urban agriculture and grazing policy, etc. And I really think, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, great field scientists have done great reports and they've really fallen on deaf ears when it comes to um, uh, being adopted by the Ministry of Agriculture officials. So I actually wanted to take this moment to sort of pitch our uh, small EPUB. Uh, we have what's called the Mongolia Field Notes. So if any of you field scientists have, uh, you know, done a field data collection and you are uh, trying to submit it to uh, academic peer paper, our uh, EPUB could be uh, a good sort of skipping stone, or, or sorry, stepping stone for uh, the, the academic paper. So it's on our website, mongoliacenter.org. And um, I, we, we noticed that like in Inner Mongolia, in China, there are a lot of like, I guess they take it via satellite. They just, there's a lot of like grazing data and they're doing a lot of, uh, empirical-based uh, policies. So they're looking at the, I guess, foliage cover, foliage level uh, across the grasslands, and they uh, calculate the, the weight, weighing capacity or, or grazing capacity, uh, and, and they sort of ad adapt their policies based uh, accordingly. So that's, uh, I think, that's something, you know, something similar that maybe we can do that as well. Um, but, um, also, Dr. DePriest mentioned a really interesting uh, thing about the, the looking at it, looking at the reindeer herders' perspective as well. Um, obviously, the Urenha people or the Tan Urenha, uh, these people have a really strong culture of hunting. You know, even from the Qing Dynasty, there's been a lot of um, uh, fur pelt supplies coming in from the area. Um, so, really interesting uh, discussions, I wanted to say. And actually, with that, we, we are a little bit running out of time. Um, but, Marissa, do you want to uh, see if anyone else sent you any questions? Uh, we can do that and then make, maybe we can. Wrap, that, wrap this up, but thank you everyone. It's been, it's been a great mm -hmm. discussion. Yeah, um, I, think, I think we're pretty good. We have some people still that were still responding to each other in the chat, but I think it's pretty much wrapped up and everybody's had a chance to, to also even just jump in in person. So I think we're ready to end our recording. <laughs>